Well, good morning all. I'm Larry Thorpe. Um, some of you may have seen me in other walks of life over the years. The last four years I've been with Canon, still with Canon, National Marketing Executive, and uh, continuing a lot of what I've been doing in former years in uh, the whole rollout of HDTV. Uh, but now I've moved out in front of the camera where I'd spent most of my life. Um, if you look at the landscape today out there in digital cinematography, it's, it's staggering. It's awesome from the, the, the very high end all the way down to 24p camcorders you can buy for literally some thousands of dollars. And underlying all of those products is an astonishing array of technologies, a bewildering array of design strategies of the different manufacturers. And very little is published in terms of details of these strategies and picking up the specs of anybody's camera, and I mean anybody's camera camcorder out there, very, very sparse. How anybody can possibly deduce the performance of a camera or camcorder from the published specs uh, is just not possible. And we're equally bad on the optical side, by the way. In fact, I would even argue that on the optical side, we're even more obtuse. We publish very, very little in terms of performance specifications. And as a consequence, there is understandably considerable um, confusion about specs out there. Uh, I spend a great deal of time talking about optical specs, keep getting sucked into camera specs, uh, et cetera. So what John and I had um, talked about last fall was the possibility of uh, putting something together that would uh, help at least give everybody a background. Uh, you're going to see a lot of stuff this morning, and don't worry, you don't have to remember it. If you just go away with a sense of some of the underlying principles. We try to make it non-technical, but frankly, that's impossible because it's a highly technical topic. But we have tried to subdue it a little bit and make it uh, a little acceptable. So we're going to ping pong a little bit. Uh, I will start out and then hand over to John, and we'll go back and forth. Um, We'd like you to hold the questions to the end, if you can, but if there's something really, really compelling that we're confusing you, just shoot your hand up and we'll try and answer it. But we'd rather not get into a big discussion until the end, and then we can go as long as we like. So without further ado, uh, I'll get rolling. I just need to remember which button to push. And uh, these are the topics we want to talk about. Looks like a torture test, but we break it down into sections and open up a little gently on this issue of pixels. Because if there's one thing that's uh, belabored out there in the industry, it's pixels. And res one of the confusions is resolution has been defined as, in a digital camera, the number of pixels in the signal being delivered. Not true. And that's one of the big things we want to get across today, is that simply is not true. However, it is true that the topic of resolution and the specifications which are bound up in discussions of pixels. But the issue is that there's pixels and there's pixels. And we first design, uh, define pixel. Uh, it came from two words. And there are imaging pixels in the sensor of the cameras. There are the digital pixels associated with the camera digitization, proce uh, processing, and interfacing. And then, of course, today, in an era of fixed pixel displays, we talk about uh, display pixels. Now, we're going to drill into the first two, imaging pixels and digital pixels, because that's the camera and camcorder. And this is where a lot of the confusion lies, particularly today. I'm going to stop using the word pixels up here. I want to use photosites, because I think it's a better descriptor. Uh, of what's going on in the imaging action. And we'll keep it for the digital. We'll use the pixel. It'll help discriminate between the two. And my thesis today is your resolution is pretty well totally determined by those uh, imaging photosites. So imager photosites are all of those little sensors in your CCD. And we can get up to millions of them today, as you well know, in, in some of the contemporary uh, images that are out there. And they are heavily involved in the transformation from that little two-dimensional optical image 
projected by the lens onto the sensors, they'll transform that into the electronic domain. That is inherently an analog process. And then in our digital camera, we have to grab that analog information and digitize it, a second step. There are some sensors today where that analog to digital conversion is done inside the sensor, but it's still a two-step. Analog transformation followed by digitization. And then digital pixels is where you take that analog information, you digitize it, you form a digital sampling structure, and then you do a lot of processing on that, and then you'll formulate interface signals that go to the outside world, to a recorder, to an editor, to a system. So the camera can be looked on as two sections, a front end, I call it the imaging section, analog, and it's in that section that your resolution is totally determined. And then that resolution, whatever it is, is handed over to the digital section of the camera or camcorder where it is then digitally represented. The resolution plus the dynamic rays, the exposure latitude, the tonal reproduction, all of the important imaging attributes have to be represented digitally. Is there a linkage between the number of imaging pixels and the number of digital pixels? Well, there can be and there may not be. And we've seen it all, and in fact, you've only got to look across the landscape now, and you'll see that uh, it is all over the map. Going back in history, in 81, when the world created the first digital standard for video, they came up with some numbers for North America of 720 horizontal samples, standard definition television, and vertically 480. That becomes 576 for the Europeans, but the whole world agreed on that. That was 1981. That was before there was any CCD cameras. It was all pickup tubes back then. But a few years later came the CCDs. And look at the photo sites. They were initially, compared horizontally, subsampled. It was all they could build at that time. And then as the 80s progressed, the manufacturers learned how to build more sophisticated CCDs. And now they started to oversample, supersample in the horizontal direction. Supersampling gives you a much better uh, resolution. And then that can be digitized, and you can end up with a, a, a very beautiful aperture, as we call it. But it is interesting, to my knowledge, even today, 20 years later, more, there's never been a professional standard definition camera that had coincidence of the optical photo sites and the digital uh, pixels. Now, maybe, but I've, I've never seen it. Whereas in high definition television, both in the tri-imager, three-chip, and the single imager, you will find a lot of linkage between the photo sites and the digital. One of the reasons for that was when the first CCD came out, three chip, back in the early 90s, they decided to go as high as they possibly could. And they made it equal to that. It was more a, a, a facilitator at the time. But after that, and particularly today, we still see lots of these. We're also seeing a lot of subsampling in high definition television. In the uh, single imager, you will see a lot of big photo site numbers, and we're going to look at what they mean. In super sampling, one camera super samples vertically. They have a lot more samples vertically that gives them a dexterity to structure different signals, progressive 60p or 60p at the other high definition standard, or an interlace, all derived from playing with the vertical super sampling. Very, very clever. In a latest, one of the latest cameras from Sony, you can argue that they are super sampling temporarily, in that they are, in the photo sites, going at 60 frames progressive per second, from which they can derive 60 interlace, or 60 frame at that other high definition standard. So we're seeing a lot of this super sampling in each of the dimensions, but not yet too much super sampling horizontally. I think it will come, but uh, no rush. Now here's a snapshot, if you will, of the way optical folks like us and the camera manufacturers think about it when we set out to design a camera. We decide on an image format size. You want a big camera with super resolution? Want a small camera with mobility? That's going to determine immediately uh, the choice of the image format size. And I've listed here 
those that are out there in the marketplace. I'm not yet getting to the large format stuff. So they will, once they decide on that, they'll talk to us optical manufacturers and plead with us to build a family of lenses, and we do that. Then they decide, the camera manufacturer says, well, whatever I've chosen here, I'm going to make some decisions on the number of photosites. And you can see that this is what's out in the marketplace now, not all of them, but most of them. They're all over the map. Different decisions have been made by different manufacturers on the number of photosites. The next decision they make is the bit depth in the A to D converter, and you'll see all three of these are in the marketplace. And then finally, the bit depth of the calculations in the red, green, blue processing for the nonlinear functions, gamma, ni, and all those very important things to, to give us our tonal reproduction. Now, a snapshot of sensors that are out there in these three formats is shown here. And again, you can see they're all over the map. Why? Well, it's each of the manufacturers wrestling with a fundamental conflict of we'd like lots of photo sites on our sensor because that will give us our resolution, as you'll see shortly. But as we put more and more photo sites on a given sensor, they get smaller and smaller. And that immediately gives us problems with noise and dynamic range. And they are crucial to your image quality. So you have this little debate between resolution and how you're going to handle dynamic range and noise, etc. And each of them makes a decision on a certain number of photosites. And then they can do some clever processing if they subsample to try and recover some of the resolution. Not all of it, but some of it. Now, an example a very contemporary example of uh, a manufacturer who's delivering a digital format, 1920 by 1080, but is using different numbers of photosites, is the latest from Panasonic in the P2 format, that I think many of you are aware of, the memory-based system. They've got three two-third inch camcorders. They all deliver 1920 by 1080, but these three each use different number of photosites. And you find that this is the most expensive, this is the least expensive. And that's the strategy. Give us a broad range in price and performance. And in fact, it's pretty spectacularly broad. I think they've done a terrific job here. Sony, another big one, has a variety of camcorders, different number of photosites. They all deliver 1920 by 1080 as the output. By the way, I should also point out that both of these companies, many of these same camcorders, will simultaneously deliver uh, the other high definition 1280 by 720. So again, there is not this tight correlation between photosites and your digital output signal. Now, a little perspective on this digital output signal. It is very important to take the two-dimensional optical image, transform it into that analog signal, then digitize it in a manner that will give us a prescribed structure and faithfully represent all of that sampling that's taken place. The horizontal resolution, the vertical resolution, the motion, the temporal resolution, the dynamic range, etc. The digital representation determines all of those, or at least determines it in the, the delivery, if you will. So it's, you can look at it like this, the analog section moved into the digital. And by the way, uh, DCI came up with a, a term that I like, the container. They say the digital structuring, if you will, sampling, is a container within which there can be a variety of analog content, variable in sharpness and variable in dynamic range and variable depending on the number of photosites, et cetera. Then there's the final formatting for the actual interface signals. And of course, it's out here that we would start a measurement if we're going to try and assess the resolution capability or other performance capabilities of a camera, we grab hold of these signals and measure them there on, on those digital signals. Now, a quick snapshot of some of the standards. The famous for standard definition, the famous ITU 601, describes what a camera or camcorder must deliver, very tightly described, and that way you can interface from all the different manufacturers all the boxes of editing and recording, et cetera, display. And the camera, again, a typical SD camera today has this uh, super sample horizontally, 
but still only delivering 720 horizontally there. In high definition, we've got two standards. These are the written standards. Again, very tightly described, the digital representation and structure. That's how we can uh, have such flexibility in what we choose from. So you have the, it can be all sorts of things going on in here, depending on what the individual camera guys decide, but they will all hand over one or both of these digital signals. You may or may not know that in the last 12 months, the SMPTE has concluded, written up, documented the standards for future ultra high definition uh, UHD TV. Uh, that's a blueprint for our future of 4K and 8K cameras, which are super sets, if you will, of the 1920 by 1080 high definition standard. And they are these documents, which you can go on the SMPTE website, but it's nice to know that those standards are done. I don't know of any product built to them yet, but certainly NHK has been demonstrating some early prototypes of, of this. Some of you may have seen it. Now in the 2K and 4K digital cinema cameras, of which we have a lot in the marketplace right now, uh, the Genesis, the Reds, the Aries, the Dulce, et cetera, uh, the Phantoms, uh, we're seeing variants of what is called 2K and 4K. Now that's where some of the confusion thickens a little bit because these folks will talk about their sensor, they're generally single sensors, and they'll say it has so many pixels, which read our photo sites, and then they'll say we're delivering a 2K and a 4K. When they say that, they're speaking about not the photo sites, they're saying the digital output from these cameras is 2K and 4K. What's not said loudly enough is that has to be 2K red, 2K green, and 2K blue, that's 6K by my count, and the 4K red and 4K green and 4K blue. Point there is it's, it is colossal data rate, colossal data rate, but it refers to the digital handover and tells you really nothing about the resolution of these cameras. That's a little more complex as we will see. Now DCI has created standards, a specification uh, that I'm sure you're all familiar with, and these numbers can be used for the 4K and the 2K to be the digital representation. Frankly, I haven't seen any of the digital cinema cameras deliver these formats on their output directly. You can, you can transform to them. Uh, they're delivering uh, outputs that are slave to their photo sites in number. But anyway, if you did deliver uh, from some uh, single sensor, large format camera, a 2K, you would be delivering at these two aspect ratios according to DCI spec, these pixel counts, digital pixel counts each for red and green and blue. That's a very key point to remember. When we talk about 2K and 4K, you'd have this pixel count or this for the red and the green and the blue. So it's really in terms of data payload, a 12K.